hello and welcome to the space above us episode 79 space shuttle flight 12 sts 41d fourth times the charm last time we talked about the flight of sts 41c as part of this complex mission, we followed along for the shuttle's first ground-up rendezvous, a nearly disastrous initial capture attempt of the Solar Max mission satellite, and the success of the second attempt two days later. This first satellite servicing mission proved out a mission type that would go on to become a shuttle mission staple. But as Solar Max and the engineers at Goddard settled back into science operations, life on the shuttle program continued, with another flight just two months away, STS-41D. With so many missions on the schedule, and less and less time between each mission, things were starting to get a little tight. The shuttle was designed to be rapidly reusable, but, as we'll discuss in more depth down the road, the rapid part of that had yet to really appear. So now, here to help shoulder some of the workload, please welcome to the stage OV-103 Space Shuttle Discovery. Discovery is essentially the same vehicle as the rest of the fleet, but benefited a little from lessons learned during the construction of Enterprise, Columbia, and Challenger, resulting in a spacecraft that weighed almost 7,000 pounds less than Columbia. Discovery also had a slightly different visual appearance, thanks to the more extensive use of thermal blankets in place of the low-temperature reusable surface insulation tiles. Both the blankets and the LRSI tiles were white, but since the blankets were significantly larger and more flexible, they gave portions of the orbiter a smoother appearance. The many small tiles on Columbia and Challenger gave it a sort of textured look on much of the vehicle. Discovery would go on to fly more missions than any other orbiter, so we'll be seeing a lot of good old OV-103. While there are a few other things that we'll get into, Probably the most notable payload for STS-41D was the OAST-1 Solar Array. This was a technology demonstration of some new solar cells, and a method for deploying them that was mounted in Discovery's payload bay. Despite folding up into a small package, after a 14 minute long deployment sequence, the Solar Array would measure over 100 feet long and 13 feet wide. Considering that the orbiter itself was 122 feet long, the solar array sticking out of the payload bay would make quite a visual if you were flying alongside it. Where's SPAS-01 when we need it? The real goal for this flight was to test the dynamics of the deployment, as well as how the structure held up to the routine stresses of spaceflight. Stuff like, hey, will it just snap off when we blip the RCS thrusters? With that in mind, only a few of the solar cells up near the top actually worked. I'm guessing they put them up near the top, just in case they were only able to deploy a little bit. That way they'd still be able to see how much power they generated. Far larger than any solar panels NASA had flown before, with only Skylab even being in the running, this was an important technology to have on hand. In fact, while I haven't run down a direct one-to-one -one connection, I will say that the solar array flown on STS-41D sure looks a lot like the solar arrays currently providing power for the International Space Station. More on that later, I suppose. Flying Discovery into orbit for the first time was a crew of six, including five rookies, three mission specialists, and a notable payload specialist. Flying in the left seat as commander was Hank Hartsfield. We know Hartsfield from his role as pilot on STS-4, flying with Ken Mattingly. This is his second of three flights. Flying in the right seat as pilot was Mike Coates. Michael Coates was born on January 16, 1946, in Sacramento, California. Coates earned a bachelor's degree at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, before continuing on to become a naval aviator. In that role, he served aboard the USS Kitty Hawk and flew over 300 combat missions in Southeast Asia. I guess the Navy liked his flying because when he returned home, he became an instructor for the same type of jet that he was flying on and off of aircraft carriers. After that, he attended the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School, where he also became an instructor. This is where NASA found him when they recruited him in 1978. Coates must have been a pretty busy guy, because the year before he was selected as an astronaut, he earned a master's degree in administration of science and technology from George Washington University, and the year after, he earned a master's degree in aeronautical engineering from the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. This is his first of three flights. <laughs> 
Moving to the back of the flight deck, we find Mission Specialist 1, Mike Mullane. Richard Michael Mullane, who went by his middle name, was born on September 10, 1945 in Wichita Falls, Texas. Mullane attended the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, earning a bachelor's degree in military engineering. He served on 150 combat missions in the skies of Vietnam as a weapons system operator, sitting in the back of the two-seater RF-4C, a variant of the F-4 Phantom Jet. His role wasn't to fly, but rather to operate the complex weapons systems while keeping his mind on the mission, no matter what maneuvers the pilot was forcing the jets through. When he returned home, he continued to serve in a variety of test and flight roles, including a four-year stint in England and, of course, the practically obligatory Edwards Air Force Base. He was serving at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida when he was selected by NASA in 1978. If you're interested in learning more about Mullane, as well as a first-hand account of this era of space history, I'd recommend checking out his book, Riding Rockets. It's an entertaining, informative, and, um colorful look at the realities of what life is like for an astronaut. I guess while I'm mentioning books, I should mention that a lot of the astronauts we've talked about have excellent biographies, most of which I just haven't been able to find the time to read. This is just one that I happen to pick up and really enjoy. This is Mullane's first of three flights. Mission Specialist 2 was Steve Hawley. Stephen Hawley was born on December 12, 1951 in Ottawa, Kansas. Hawley graduated from the University of Kansas, where he earned a bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy and served as a research assistant at the U.S. Naval Observatory and National Radio Astronomy Observatory. He moved on to Lick Observatory at the University of California, studying gaseous nebulae and picking up a Ph.D. in astronomy. He was working on his postdoc down in Chile when he got scooped up by NASA in 1978. In 1982, he married fellow Class of 1978 astronaut Sally Ride. I mention this because according to Mullane's book, he was often introduced first as the husband of Sally Ride, and I figured I'd keep up the tradition. This is his first of five space flights. And rounding out the mission specialists was Mission Specialist 3, Judy Resnick. Judith Resnick was born on April 5, 1949 in Akron, Ohio. Resnick graduated from Carnegie Mellon University, picking up a degree in electrical engineering. She was hired by RCA, who put her to work developing integrated circuitry for phased array radar control systems, as well as providing engineering support for NASA sounding rockets. After RCA, she worked in the Laboratory of Neurophysiology at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. While in Maryland, she earned her PhD in electrical engineering. She was working as a senior systems engineer at Xerox in 1978 when NASA came calling. In addition to all this technical work, Resnick was also a classical pianist, gourmet cook, and rally racing navigator. This is her first of two spaceflight assignments, with her second being Challenger's ill-fated STS-51L mission. And last but not least, Payload Specialist 1, Charlie Walker. Charles Walker was born on August 29, 1948, in Bedford, Indiana. Walker earned a bachelor's degree in aeronautical and astronautical engineering from Purdue University, but didn't immediately move into an aerospace-related field. Instead, he spent some time as a civil engineering technician, land acquisition specialist, and forest firefighter for the U.S. Forest Service. But after that, he joined the Bendix Aerospace Company, and worked on stuff a little more aerospacey, like missile subsystem design. He applied to be an astronaut in the class of 1978, but was not selected. Not to be deterred, he joined McDonnell Douglas, one of the major companies involved with the shuttle program. Over the years, he worked on a number of subsystems and payloads, including the Continuous Flow Electrophoresis Device, or CEPHAS. His inclusion on this flight is notable because with it, he becomes the first person not working directly for a government to fly in space. He continued to draw a paycheck from McDonnell Douglas. So while he may have missed out on becoming a career astronaut, he still achieved his goal of flying in space. This is his first of three flights. Discovery, the newest orbiter on the block, had its share of growing pains, resulting in a less than silky smooth first launch. The first launch attempt was on June 25, 1984, but had to be called off due to a computer failure. No big deal. Engineers headed over to the OPF, popped a similar computer out of Challenger, 
installed it in Discovery, and the next day it was time for a second attempt. This time there was no computer problem, and the count ticked down past all the major milestones. Launch controllers were pulled and responded with Go. The computers checked every facet of the vehicle and found no problems. The engines were swiveled to ensure that they'd perform as needed once Discovery was flying free. T-31 seconds, auto sequence start. At T-6 seconds, the engines were commanded on. First engine 3 on the right, then engine 2 on the left, and then engine 1 under the tail were each given the command to ignite, separated by a fraction of a second. Valves regulating oxidizer and fuel were opened, propellant began to rush into the combustion chambers, and a billowing cloud of steam emerged from the launch pad's flame trench. But at T-4 seconds, everything suddenly became very quiet. The engines had shut down. The steam wafted away, and on the flight loop the call went out, we have an RSLS abort. So, what the heck just happened? What happened was an RSLS abort. The RSLS, or Redundant Set Launch Sequencer, is the system responsible for the millisecond perfect sequence of events required to get the space shuttle safely off the launch pad. To mere humans, the rapid-fire sequence of events is far too much to keep up with. Better to have the lightning reflexes and impartiality of a computer. And while it may seem like only a few short moments between the first main engine ignition and the fiery liftoff, to a computer it's practically an eternity, more than six seconds. That's plenty of time to calmly take a look around and make sure that things are proceeding as expected, before lighting up the SRBs and irrevocably committing to a launch. And in this case, all was not well. Though engine number 3 received the first command to launch, eagle-eyed viewers would notice that engine 2 lights first. This is because the system responsible for operating the main fuel valve on engine number 3 failed. As I understand it, the backup system kicked in, but the computer was not happy with the lack of redundancy. And since the shuttle was still safely on the ground, it was best to just stay right where they were. Discovery wobbled back and forth on its launch mounts, ground controllers scrambled to verify that the vehicle was in a safe state, and on Discovery's flight deck, mission specialist Steve Hawley turned to Mike Mullane and said, I thought we'd be hired when the engines quit. After a scary moment when someone noticed that engine number one wasn't reporting that it had shut down, it turns out it never actually started up, things began to calm down a bit. But then the natural question arose, should the crew get out? With such a contingency in mind, the crew had been trained to leave the orbiter, run over to some special baskets hanging from cables attached to the launch pad, and slide to a safe bunker away from the now potentially dangerous spacecraft. But no, it seemed that everything was safe, and it was probably best for the crew to just sit tight. Which is good, because it turns out that down below, an invisible hydrogen fire was currently burning on the pad. This is actually not quite as terrifying as it sounds, at least for the equipment. The pad gets blasted pretty good during a launch after all, but for the crew, it is pretty scary. There is a chance that if the crew had attempted to evacuate, they would have run straight into one of these invisible fires. Instead, the fire was eventually doused, and as an added precaution, sprinklers were enabled as the crew left, completely soaking them. Not the best launch attempt. This was not a simple problem that could be turned around in 24 hours. In fact, the next attempt wouldn't be made for over two months. Discovery had to be rolled back to the VAB, and its engine was replaced. The delay was sufficiently long that there was actually a casualty, STS-41F. With STS-41E already cancelled due to issues with the payload, STS-41F was next on the docket. But Discovery's abort had caused enough schedule pressure that the commsats scheduled to fly on 41F were instead given to 41D. So when the crawler transporter rumbled back out to the pad with Discovery on its back once again, there were three commsats now keeping the OAST-1 experiment company in the payload bay. One of my goals with this podcast is to try to contextualize events that are often viewed in a vacuum. Missions don't just come out of nowhere. They're proposed, planned, and trained for, often for years at a time. With this in mind, I wanted to mention that on August 27th, 1984, two days before STS-41D went for another launch attempt, President Reagan announced the Teacher in Space project. With spaceflight becoming more and more common, and even non-government employees now flying, 
the thought was that missions could now be considered routine and safe. The goal of this project was to select a school teacher, have them train with an astronaut crew, launch, teach lessons in orbit, and return home to continue their important work while passing on their new spacebound perspective. The hope was that it would simultaneously demonstrate the sophistication of our space program, as well as serve as an inspiration to kids everywhere, kids who would then enter fields related to science and technology. Of course, the Teacher in Space project would end in tragedy a year and a half later, when we'll discuss it in more detail, but I thought it was important to show that this didn't just pop up overnight. Two months after its first launch attempt, Discovery and the STS-41D crew were back on the launch pad on August 29th for another try. But a few hours later, the dejected crew were walking back to the van that would return them to their quarters. A software glitch in the system responsible for commanding the separation of the SRBs and external tank forced them to wait another day. But at long last, on August 30th, 1984, launch day arrived. For realsies this time. Despite a minor computer hiccup and an airspace intrusion by a curious or oblivious private pilot, on the fourth attempt, the countdown made it all the way to zero, the SRBs ignited, and Discovery roared off the launch pad for the first time. As far as anyone could tell, the ascent went perfectly smoothly. However, later analysis would show that there was a major concern with the solid rocket boosters. I've previously mentioned incidents of damage to the O-rings responsible for sealing the joints between SRB segments. Today's problem was a little more severe, the first occurrence of what's called blow-by. Hot gases had managed to completely bypass the primary O-ring and impinge on the secondary O-ring. This problem could build on itself since the gases flowing past the O-ring would further damage it, allowing more gas to escape but analysis showed that this blow-by lasted only briefly, and the secondary O-ring held. While even a minor amount of blow-by was unusual and distressing, it seemed that the redundant secondary O-ring had done its job, and the system had recovered. Based on experience from previous missions, it seemed like maybe this, like many other things, was just a normal, if unexpected, aspect of flying the shuttle. But all of this was unknown to the crew who had arrived safely in orbit and were starting to get to work. First on the agenda was the deployment of SBS-4. SBS-4, the exciting sequel to SBS-3, the first shuttle payload to be deployed, was yet another communication satellite based on the Hughes HS-376 spacecraft bus. After a smooth deployment and orbiter separation maneuver, SBS-4 rode its PAMD upper stage into geostationary transfer orbit. With the previous PAMD failures in mind, the crew used the camera on the remote manipulator system to keep an eye on the engine burn, but it went off without a hitch. The second day arrived, and it was time for another ComSat deployment. This one was a little different. The SYNCOM-4 satellite was the first to be explicitly designed for launch on the space shuttle. Previous satellites had been designed with expendable launch vehicles in mind, and had been adapted to fit the orbiter payload bay. But with SYNCOM-4, engineers took advantage of the spacious payload bay and designed a satellite that was too bulky to fit into the payload fairing on top of any expendable launch vehicle. The satellite was the first of a five-satellite constellation that would provide enhanced communications for the Department of Defense. Well, actually, this was the second. The first was in the payload bay for the aborted launch attempt, and the second was slated for STS-41F. So I guess since they were already taking 41F's other payloads, they swapped this one out too. It's also notable for trying out a new deployment technique, delightfully called a Frisbee Deploy. I'm guessing it's called this because if you were watching from the crew cabin, you'd see the spacecraft rotating along the orbiter's long axis, edge on to you observing it, as it moved up and out of the payload bay as opposed to something like SBS-4, which rotated along the same quote-unquote up axis as it was pushed along. So if SBS-4 is thrown like a spiraling football, SYNCOM-4 is thrown like a frisbee. Hence, frisbee deploy. And last in our series of ComSat deployments on the third day was Telstar-3. Well, we sort of anticlimactically talked about the interesting one in the middle, because this is another generic ComSat based on the HS-376 bus. 
So this is another one of those big cylinders stuck on a PAMD upper stage that is spun up and kicked out of the payload bay. I'm sure much to the relief of folks on the ground and orbit, both spacecraft that relied on a PAMD for their ride to GEO suffered no issues with their upper stages. So with the successful deployment of Telstar 3, this mission's contribution to the burgeoning commercial satellite business was complete. Also on the third day, the OAST-1 solar array experiment was partially deployed, rising out of the payload bay to 70% of its full extent before being folded back down. The following day, the apparatus was extended to 100% of its length and subjected to stress tests such as RCS thruster firings. The array held up great and actually performed even better than expected, quickly damping the oscillations induced by the thruster firings. This was great since it meant that large-scale solar panels planned for future missions looked like they should work with no problems. And since it was a drama-free test, the crew had a little extra time to get ahead on other tasks. While all of these satellite deployments and solar array tests were going on, there were the usual slew of minor activities that I often don't get around to mentioning. One was operating an IMAX camera, which was recording footage for an upcoming film about the space shuttle. Another was characterizing the mysterious glow that was sometimes observed on the skin of the shuttle during orbital night. After noticing this over several missions and experimenting a bit, it seemed to occur on the windward face, that is the side pointing in the direction that they were traveling, and the glow's strength depended on the orbiter's altitude. Other than just being a really neat phenomenon, it was important to understand so that people planning sensitive optical experiments would know what to expect. Down on the mid-deck, Charlie Walker was hard at work on another iteration of the Cephas experiment that we've seen fly so many times before. Again, the continuous flow electrophoresis experiment took advantage of the microgravity environment to separate particles, which could be useful for the pharmaceutical industry. Walker had actually worked on the design of this device, so was the perfect person to operate it during its most demanding test yet. In this case, it would be running for 100 hours in one continuous session, as opposed to several smaller batches like had been done before. I wasn't able to find any details on how it went, other than the fact that 85% of the samples were processed, so it sounds like it went mostly alright, but maybe it wasn't quite as smooth as hoped. Incidentally, if anyone knows if anything came of all these CFES experiments, shoot me an email, jp at thespaceabove.us, because I haven't been able to nail anything down, and I'm curious how it all shook out. But considering that there aren't any new miracle drugs being manufactured at massive scale in space, I'm betting that it didn't work out quite like everyone was hoping. Alongside all of these activities, a problem was developing. Controllers on the ground noticed something odd about the temperatures of the wastewater and supply water dump nozzles. These nozzles are used to dump excess fluids from the orbiter, venting them out into space. The supply water, I believe, was used for dumping excess water generated by the fuel cells. This was drinkable water that could be used by the crew, but they only needed so much, so the rest would be dumped overboard. The wastewater nozzle was responsible for getting rid of wastewater, which is a polite way of saying pee. To ensure that all this fluid actually stayed fluid as it was sprayed out into space, the nozzles were heated. But ground controllers saw some suspicious temperatures on these nozzles that made them concerned that rather than spraying cleanly, some ice could be building up on the side of the orbiter. It turns out that there was a similar suspicion on STS-41B, but it was never followed up on. With the recurrence of this problem, time was carved out of the busy mission to navigate the remote manipulator system out of the payload bay and over to the orbiter's side so that it could look at the nozzles. And what did they find there? Sticking two and a half feet out into space was an icicle. An icicle made of pure water from the fuel cells and um, less pure water from the waste collection system. Suddenly, another oddity from STS-41B made sense. Some damage had been observed on the Ohms pod at the back of the orbiter that couldn't be explained. But if there had been a big chunk of ice that broke free during re-entry, it easily could have impacted the Ohms pod and created the observed damage. After consulting with folks on the ground, a simple solution was proposed and successfully executed. The crew used the RMS arm to just bump the icicle and break it off. Sometimes the easy fix is the best one. 
Less easy was that for the rest of the mission, the crew would have to resort to the old waste collection bags of the Apollo days. No more water dumps meant no more toilet. At least for number one. For more detail than you might want about how this was managed, see Mullane's book. I actually stumbled across an analysis of the situation written by the guy tasked with fixing the nozzle for future missions. According to his analysis, the 41B icicle was caused by lower water pressure, which widened the spray pattern, while the 41D icicle was caused by the switch to thermal blankets. Since the nozzle was recessed down in a sort of hole surrounded by the blankets, it was easy for the blankets to catch some of the water and start the icicle growing. The fix involved both a redesign of the nozzle itself and swapping out a small amount of the thermal blanket for thermal tiles around the nozzles. You can actually spot this if you look closely at photographs of Discovery. Search for a picture of the STS-41D landing and a later Discovery landing and look down into the right of the main hatch. In the later photos, you'll see a small black square, which is where the nozzles and their new thermal tiles are. Six days, 56 minutes, and four seconds after finally lifting off, Discovery touched down safely at Edwards Air Force Base, 30,000 pounds of deployables lighter. The mission had more than its fair share of trouble getting started and encountered a couple of minor hiccups while in orbit, but in the end, it was a complete success. It simultaneously kept NASA's commercial customers happy, pushed along fancy technology for powering future spacecraft, and welcomed a new orbiter to the growing fleet. It also provided yet another reminder, from the O-rings to the water nozzles, that spaceflight will never tolerate carelessness, incapacity, and neglect. Next time! Challenger's back in the hot seat, ready for its sixth flight. Crippen and Ride fly again, Goddard's got a new satellite to deploy, and Kathy Sullivan is ready to become the first American woman to walk in space. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. Thank you.